Hi, you guys. Welcome back. This is Richard Sachs. This is Lost Arts Radio you're listening to. And I want to tell you about the show tonight that uh, several weeks ago, I saw a lady who was talking on Alex's show about the world of Walt Disney and all the empire that's come out of that and incredible uh, mind control aspects and corruption and things that I had no idea about. And I thought, wow, if we could possibly get that lady to come on Lost Arts Radio, that would be super exciting. And I'm speaking not just as a disinterested observer, but I was an absolute devotee of Disney as a little kid and actually went to Disneyland in 1954. And I think they had just opened in California and rode on all the rides and went to Tomorrowland and wasn't too concerned about mind control. It, it felt like a fantastic, uplifting experience. And so what was being presented on the show with Alex was stuff I had never heard of. And I thought, let's find out what it means and especially what it means for relevance to the ride that we're all on right now that's intended to end badly and how that could be turned around. So that we're welcoming Jamie Hanshaw. And I really appreciate her being here. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks for having me. It's going to be a fun discussion. Yeah. So you just to let people know how you got into this stuff for some background and people that have no idea what we're talking about. Do you want to just um, a little, little bit of lead up to where you are now? Sure. I mean, how I got into all of it or just the Disney stuff in particular? As much, not just Disney, but the whole thing. Okay. Um, my family or my mother in particular was kind of a first generation conspiracy theorist, you know, in the nineties before, um, there was no internet. There was nothing like that. We would go to, uh, like the Bible bookstore and rent VHSs about the Clintons or, um, FEMA camps or black helicopters, you know, the nineties conspiracies. So I always kind of had that, um, foundation of questioning and distrusting um, authorities and things like that. Was so, that about 2000 that the first VHS machines came out? 2000? Uh, when was that? Wait, or no, it was VHS. Closer, closer so to 1980. Like 1980. Yeah. So I grew up in the 90s and this is like the time when I was learning about that stuff. And then I got a little older um, and the first book that really kind of blew my worldview apart was David Icke. I read him in maybe like 2006. Right. So I was starting to unravel a lot of different mysteries and I just went headfirst into studying um whatever I could get my hands on. I'd always been that kind of person. I was homeschooled. Oh, so wow. I was allowed. It accounts to your being conscious at this point. It, w it allowed me to um, pursue the things that I was interested in, learn things that I wanted to learn. Wow. And it wow. made me a different kind of person. I'm very self-taught in uh, a lot of things. Right. Um, so just a, a different education, a different way of thinking. Um, I wasn't forced into any kind of mold um, taught to be this or that. You know, my parents were very hands off when it came to my education. Mm -hmm. So that's how I ended up weird. You know, my mom's a conspiracy theorist and I'm a homeschool and we were, you know, very um, strict Christian family. So... Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have a chance, man. I just, <laughs> so the yeah. weirdness got into the titles of your books. Yeah. I yes. Forgot, I forgot to mention three books that you wrote, and that was a series, right? The I weird, did. Weird um, yeah. So about 2012, I published my first book, which I don't um, sell myself anymore. If you're really interested in that one, you can get it on Amazon because I've changed a lot of my worldview since then. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah just because I was going through a lot of learning and I was guilty of a lot of syncretism. Like I thought all religions had kind of the same uh, starting point and they, you know, a core that was, they could all be lumped together somehow. Mm -hmm. and I studied a lot of occult. I studied anything you could think of hermeticism, alchemy, 
magic, Kabbalah, uh, Eastern, Tao, Zen, just the right. whole smorgasbord. Right. right. I've lived um, a very unconventional lifestyle. I just had uh, my boyfriend who was also very deep into like uh, occult magic and conspiracy theories. So mm. we did a lot of study together and produced a lot of content um, together even before <clears throat> there was even YouTube or Google or anything like that. We would go down to mm. Austin Access and make a like a uh, Access TV show. Wow. Like okay. Wayne's World or something, but you know, with like right. theories. Um, so that kind of got popular. And then I, so I wrote the first one and then I wrote the second one, which I still sell because it doesn't have any theological things in it. With it weird stuff. Is it volume two? Because yeah, it's this, so, yeah, this is part two. And And where do you get that? You can get it on jaysanalysis.com. Okay. And, and under the tab shop. And so I kind of <clears throat> came up with this idea that I read a Fritz Springmeier book. I'm sure you've heard of him. Sure. Uh, How to Create Your Own Undetectable Mind Control Slave mm-hmm. book. And he had a little thing in there about princess programming um, was one of the parts of the MK Ultra programs, like princess programming. So I kind of ran with that. I did a lot of um, study on Disney and I wrote a lot of articles and much of my book has Disney um, symbols in it. And I use Disney movies to illustrate. I came up with like the princess warrior paradigm that was really big in the 2000s. Okay. So like in the 2000s, if you went to Walmart or Target or your big box stores, you'd have pink princess aisles for girls yeah and you'd have the blue uh military driven uh masculine toys for boys exactly soldiers and stuff yes yeah. so i kind of like wrote about princess programming for girls and warrior programming for boys because you know disney is a military industrial partner if not completely a corporation for the military industrial complex and they want to make soldiers Right? right. So why do they want the girls to be princesses? How does that work? Man, I've put a lot of thought into this. And in this book, I talk about the princess programming and narcissism and how they can get a girl to be the ultimate consumer. Hmm. Because Disney, uh, you know, much of their mega millions is made on the, the toys and the merchandise, not just the movie, but selling the plushy toys and the, yeah. everything that goes along with it. Um, so I was focusing on female narcissism, um, just the neuroticism that comes with trying to live up to some kind of beauty standard, um, unattainable beauty standards, um, unattainable wealth. Uh, if you watch like shows that came out in that era, like, um, my super sweet 16 an mtv show do you remember that show when was that approximately oh that was in the 2000s so they would follow okay. these girls who were um you know come from really wealthy families and their 16th birthday party is supposed to be an event but just the amount of entitlement that these girls had and spoiled brattiness and just i mean unhinged behavior because of they didn't get their way or they didn't, you know, they got a white Corvette instead of a pink one or, you know, right. so they would have fit. And they, they were the role model, right? The yeah. Idea. So I'm like, th- this is kind of where they are leading girls. And I noticed um, in the 2000s that Disney was exploding in their franchises like Hannah Montana became huge. Every girl that age had a Hannah Montana poster. Wow. And not just that, but you would go into stores and the Hannah Montana merchandise was overwhelming. Like you couldn't even go into the auto parts store without seeing, uh, you know, Hannah Montana keychain at the auto parts store. I even made a little YouTube video, like a jokey one, a a long, long time ago. We went to all of these stores and I'm like, anything that you could need for your household has Hannah Montana product. 
and we were just filling up shopping carts. Every aisle was Hannah Montana. So I'm like, this is a concentrated agenda to saturate the culture with Disney and give them role models that they follow. And now look at where Miley Cyrus has gone. Right. Right. Um, I don't know if I can show this. This is the the third book I wrote. It's not part three. It's like a a different one, but it does have a parental guidance on it because. Hollywood uh, mind control, right? Yes. And let me see if I can find it. So, you know, Hannah Montana was just the cute little um, Nashville girl. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'll, I'm just going to flash this real quick, okay? Sure. But this, this is what you'll see at her concert. You see? So there's some difference in how she's evolved. Uh, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> so now she's looking like some kind of, you know, demonic Priapus Pan character. It's just amazing how far down they can take a poor girl. And this has to do, in my opinion, and a lot of other people's opinion, with monarch mind control. Okay, so what is that monarch mind control? This is something that came out of World War II <clears throat> and Project Paperclip. Okay. And where they brought over um, Nazi scientists to work in America, like Werner von Braun and um, other doctors who'd been conducting experiments, <clears throat> experiments on how to m- make someone more suggestible, like a Manchurian candidate. You know, if you traumatize someone, Mm -hmm. you can get them to disassociate and they create altered states for themselves. And if you know what you're doing, you can figure out how to control that person while they're in an altered state. So, for people that don't know, this is when they had the Nazi war criminal trials at Nuremberg and they convicted and killed a few people, but most of them they hired either the U.S. government or other governments. They went to the East and West and kept doing the work they were doing already. Mm-hmm. Right? And in the U.S., and, they did mind control work. And famous scientists, too. I mean, Werner von Braun worked with Jack Parsons. He worked with right. Walt Disney. Um, he, was, he worked for NASA. Right. So, these yeah. connections get very weird at the top when you start to dig into it. So, at what point did you your investigation to get to the point where you were looking at all this stuff and Disney and all these different pieces to put together? Disney kind of catapulted in the early 2000s um, till now. So this is something I've been tracking. And like I said, through Hannah Montana, and then I started getting really deep into like Disney movies and their symbolism. Um, I wrote in my first book about Walt Disney himself as the character. Okay. Because, you know, he kind of has this carte blanche as American icon of wholesome family values. Well, most people saw it that way in their first encounter. Mm -hmm. So, what happened with you? Why didn't you see it like everybody else? Or did you start that way and then change over? Yeah, you start that way. I mean, I loved Disney when I was a kid. My favorite movie was Mary Poppins. Okay, okay. Uh, Probably still is. I mean, I do love that movie. I watched, you know, Little Mermaid, Aladdin, Lion. Yeah, okay. I was wondering about that. So you, you were drawn into it like everybody else. Oh I thought, yeah, I, I thought it was it. great too. Yeah, and the art, <clears throat> the artistry of the old cartoons, I love. I don't like Pixar, really. Well, they uh, were doing animation by hand at that time. Exactly. So right. every movie was a different, you know, work of art that was unique. It was incredible art. Yeah. Yeah. Beauty and the Beast, you know, some of that. Yeah, that was incredible. So what, what started to crack that image for you? Um, I'm especially interested because you're coming from a non, a less brainwashed starting point as a homeschool kid. Yeah. Right. And okay. with parents that are encouraging your open thought, stuff like that. If I could go back... Uh, there was a series that was made by um, a Christian group. I can't remember exactly what it was called. It was like, what parents don't know about witchcraft or something like that. And I, okay. I was given that when I was a uh, middle schooler and talking about um, occult and witchcraft in Disney movies. And 
their examples back then were like Fantasia, um, mm. Black Cauldron, you know, the the witchiness of it, you know, Wicked Witch, not Wicked Witch, that's Wizard of Oz, um, the witch from Snow White. Yeah. So, th- Fantasia had some kind of a, a devil character type who was standing up in a, a big black robe and stuff like that. It did have a scary devil in it. And then, um, so I, I always, you know, just kind of had these little seeds like, you know, occult is and witchcraft is not good but then when i kind of grew up a little bit and like i said i I went through these phases of what is true Mm -hmm. um and so i i put that stuff on the shelf and i i studied all the occult i studied you know satanism what's the difference between a, a luciferian and a satanist and a transhumanist and a um a setian you know, because I really wanted to get it right and understand, like, if you say you worship Satan, but you don't believe in Satan, what is that all about? How could that happen? That sounds contradictory. Um, well, if you, this is kind of getting off topic, but um, the actual works of the Church of Satan itself, which only started in 1966 by a guy called Anton LaVey, uh-huh. he was sort of a carnival con, con man. Okay. And, he wanted to start a religion based on atheism. And so he's, he's like, um, we worship Satan in principle, and, but the principle is that we are God and we are apex predator, basically like social Darwinism. Uh, good, there's no good or bad, it, only what suits you. So get whatever you can, basically. Yes, and there's no afterlife. Um, so your, your typical Levian Satanist does not believe in God or Satan. They just believe in straight evolution. And there's no consequences for anything you do to other people and stuff like that. No. So it's rule uh, rule of the strongest yeah. or, the, or the most clever. Survival, or, exactly. Survival yeah. of the fittest. Um, mm-hmm. I studied, you know, Alistair Crowley, who's a different type of Satanist. Uh, he did believe in the spirit world. He did believe in channeling um, extra dimensional characters right right and so there's there's all these nuanced differences that i wanted to understand because i didn't want to just go out there and you know run my mouth and be wrong about what i'm talking about yeah those are really different approaches exactly i mean making up some justification for just doing whatever you want versus experiencing some extra dimensional entity telling you what to do Mm -hmm. and rewards and stuff like that Mm-hmm. And then you have your Luciferians, which is a whole different genre. Um, they actually do believe in the spirit world, but they believe more like a Gnostic that uh, Yahweh is the Demiurge. And Lucifer is like the Prometheus character that's trying to free mankind of its uh, shackles of devotion to a lesser creator. So, Lucifer's a hero in that, yes. right? Yes, Lucifer to them is the light bearer, the savior, and okay. the enlightener. Of Which the is what the name literally means. Exactly, right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And then, uh, we were talking about Fantasia. So, I, in about 2008, that's when I read the Fritz Springmeier book, and he has a lot in there about Disney, and he talks about how... Monarch programmers will use Disney characters, Disney movies um, as scripts of hypnotism and dissociation because children are drawn to these things. So, just for people that don't know, what do you mean when you say dissociation? If you are torturing someone enough, their mind... It's a safety mechanism that everybody has mm-hmm. in their psyche that will stop that. Like when you get into a car accident or something, or something bad happens, and you're like, it's a blur, I don't remember. Right. Because your brain is trying to protect you from negative memories. So it's running away, basically. So if they do this um, systematically and scientifically, you can create that effect and get somebody to disassociate. And they call it, the feeling of it like floating like a butterfly um, <clears throat> and 
create alter personalities that remember the horrific thing that happened so the core person does not have to deal with those memories wow and yeah i mean i, I recommend anybody read this first primary book because if if you read that you've cracked the code of what's going on in pop culture and what one of my theories is that i posited we are all um by proxy kind of victims of this trauma-based mind control if not mm. um directly but we are being initiated into it and it's the motivation for it would be that what you think is reality is so horrible that you want to be in some fantasy yes. and they and they provide the fantasy oh yeah yeah so they can set up structures and frameworks and, and if you read this book it's super detailed they can build your inner psyche on a carousel or they can build it on a house with many rooms and you're stuck in the basement it's just really fascinating what your brain can do and the lengths that it can go to to protect itself and all of the different um personalities that can come out uh, when you are traumatized and trying to protect your core personality. Also, they found that people who are very creative are mm -hmm. better at this. More subject to it, you mean? Yes, and they, um, they can do this better and they don't go crazy. So a lot of times, uh, if they would try this on somebody and they would just you know, ruin their brain and they'd end up in an asylum or something. Right, right. But the ones that can handle it and progress through, um, if they're creative enough, they can use art as an outlet. Does that make sense? Yeah, and they, they're better at maintaining a balance between multiple personalities and not feeling um, non-functional. Right, and expressing themselves through their art. Right. Like um, Lady Gaga does this a lot, and I think she's probably been through some kind of monarch mind control uh -huh. um, because she talks about going through hospital wards and the doctors, uh, she pretends they're wearing designer clothes and she just uh, pretends she's somewhere else. I have a quote from her in this book about that. And there is a video that she made called Prelude Pantique, where it's just like a little vignette, a mini movie about her disassociation. Well, it kind of brings up the issue of uh, what we've heard from a number of Hollywood stars that they're offered success in exchange for certain actions, um, pledging allegiance to Satan being one of the main ones. Yes, and a lot of them, this is a generational thing, and that's why they also refer to it as the monarch program, because they've figured out that monarch butterflies in the way that they migrate and their patterns and everything has to be passed down genetically. Mm -hmm. um, so this epigenetic memory, they call it, is something that the is passed down through bloodlines. And so if you've got a person who's been traumatized in, in satanic family has a child, they're more apt at these things that we're talking about. So when you started getting aware of this whole world of trauma-based mind control, was that originally centered around Disney or is that a secondary interest that came up? Um, it just kind of dovetailed because <clears throat> Disney was really taking over the culture, like I said. So I'm trying to remember, I was reading for Springer, I lived in Austin, Texas. This is when the Hannah Montana was at its peak. And so I just... Disney was on my radar because they kept on scooping up all of the media. Like they bought, you know, Marvel and Star Wars and Fox and ABC. And so they became right in front of me, the biggest multimedia conglomerate in the world. And most people would assume that that came personally from Walt Disney as a person. But it seems to me more likely that he would have been chosen to have it go through him and some other entity would be directing and controlling the de development of it well okay walt disney is an interesting character all by himself because he would mm -hmm. say that walt disney is a character and that i play 
What is in I play? What does that mean? Like he he plays the the wholesome family man, uh, child at heart, imagination. Yeah, every interview he was like, that kind of a personality was coming out. Yeah, so he played Uncle Walt basically. I, yeah, that's right. Um, but in the real world, he was a very tortured. Um, had a lot of vices. He well. If you want to go back to the beginning, he was from Missouri, and the main street of his town, Marceline, Missouri, is actually what he um, based Main Street Disneyland on. So mm. it's like hometown USA feel. Right. Um, so this was his youth that he was trying to recreate in Disneyland because his father was very abusive. Um, he had suffered a lot of beatings. He suffered a lot of hunger. He suffered a lot of overwork as a child. Mm. Uh, his brother, Roy Disney, you've heard of Roy Disney. Uh, he yeah. actually ran away from home because of this and left Walt there to deal with that on his own. And so he always really idolized his older brother and did not care for his father because his father was an abusive person. Uh, he tried to enlist in the Navy in World War I. Uh. Walt did to get away, but there was a problem with his birth certificate. So his parents were acting all weird about it. And there was this thing where he just couldn't get official paperwork on himself. To prove who he was, you mean? Yeah. And this led to um, a door where we'll talk about this in a second, but the government can come in and say, we'll, we'll try and help you find who your actual parents are for if this is real or not. Yeah. Partner with us, you know? So this is how they got him to work for the FBI. When he was a teenager, basically? No, this was later on when he was already established. Okay. But, okay. but when he was a teenager, when he was trying to join the Red Cross, this is like where it all started for him. Like, who am I if my parents are acting shady and, you know, right. about who I am? So he joins the Red Cross by like uh, lying on a form. He changed to zero to a one or something like that for his okay. birth year. Right, right. Um, so during the war, he would go out and collect relics and sell them as like war relics. But if they weren't beat up enough, he would put a bullet hole in a, a helmet and paint on it or something. Okay, you know? right. Give it a little more pizzazz so it was mm. worth more so this is kind of like a picture is forming of a character that you know has a theatrical um attitude and doesn't mind fudging things and doctoring them for appearance right so the trauma in his family was like the trauma-based mind control for him well, definitely the the beatings and yeah. everything. Um, I can't remember if his dad was like alcoholic or gambler or both, or it was something like that, you know? Okay, right. Uh, so then he was used by the um, B'nai B'rith in the 30s to bring like family values back to Hollywood and deflect scandals because Hollywood was becoming like Sin City almost in the 30s. Mm-hmm. Um, and people would refer to it as Babylon, and this is when the Great Depression was coming on, and they're like, we need to get back to our, you know, wholesome roots, and all these uh, people in Hollywood are demoralizing society. So, so you they, said he was chosen by Benai Burit? Yeah, so they chose him to prop him up as a, you know, a reinvigoration of Hollywood uh P, uh, G rated Hollywood. What kind of organization would you say that is? Or what? That is a, I don't, it's a Jewish organization. And, and why would they be interested in doing something because like choosing? The media moguls of that time of golden age of Hollywood were all um, Jewish people. Hmm. Like, uh, Metro Goldwyn Mayer and, um, you know, just the, the big Hollywood Paramount and the, the studios, right. all of their heads were Jewish. And so the people like American people during this time were like, the, they're destroying our um, culture. And so with Hollywood, and right. it was really targeted at this group of people. I'm not saying anything about that group 
um, other than this is just what happened. So they were in charge of trying to get a better image. Yes. So they're trying to repair their reputation um, in America and in Hollywood because, Mm -hmm. you know, Hollywood was pretty smutty in those eras. Why do you think they Uh, chose him? um, Probably because of the cartoons. You know, he was a, a cartoonist. He was a he was animator. Animator, right. Yeah. So, mm. to deflect the scandals, they're like, okay, so we have Disney. And so, this is why Disney was so strict back in the day. Like, um, if you hear stories of the studios, working at the studios, there was no um, mixing of men and women. There was no mustaches. There was no uh, mm. long hair. There was no smoking. There was It, it was wow. supposed to be, like, super clean cut. Right. Um, and a lot of times people who put on the facade of being ultra conservative have darker, you know, shadow sides that they're trying to hide. Right. So. Interesting. um, So finding his true parentage was kind of like this thing that always nagged at him. It was like the bane of his existence because he, you know, he's a imposter at wholesomeness if he, if his parents were not legitimate right yeah so yeah like this is the issue that hoover used to strike a deal where walt agreed to assist in the crusade against the spread of communism in hollywood in at that time okay when was that approximately uh this was like in the 50s i think okay it was called the something for un-american activities uh you can look that up it's a whole big thing okay but he was going to put out uh, promotional material, anti-communist material. Yeah, and like testify against uh, potential communists and things like House of Un-American Activities is what it's called. Okay, and, yeah. and did that have a uh, connection to the movies that he was doing at that time? Because he had a lot of fantasy movies coming out. Um, n- not really. So he did propaganda for World War II. A ton of it. Um, he did um, so right after World War One. The Pearl Harbor event happened in nineteen forty-one. Right, forty-one. The next day, he got to his studio in Burbank and found that it was commandeered by military. He there was like jeeps and trucks and men mm. just like all wondering. He's like, "What's going on?" and he finds out it's been commandeered as a primary defense station and 90% of the production of his studio went into government training and propaganda films. And there is a great DVD series about this called Disney on the front lines. So thing he would be putting out things about why everybody should sign up to go into the military and that sort of thing. Okay. Exactly. So films like um, chicken little, talking about using psychology to create false narratives and false flags to undermine the faith in the masses and scare them into like trusting idiots basically and subsequently lead to their death. I don't know if you've ever seen the old chicken little. It's worth a look because it's a a lesson in psychology. Actually, Is it it like a cartoon or what? It is. is Yeah. It's a little cartoon. It's only about 10 minutes long, but each step of the way, they're giving you um, clues into how they use psychology to influence the masses of people. Do you have a, uh, a link to it, to a version of it? Um, just if you could just go on YouTube, just put Chicken Little um, okay. 50s or whatever, the old one. But yeah, that's an interesting one. They did uh, films um, about army psychotherapy, talking about stress, adrenal glands, the basics of fear and how to instill it. Um, they talk about, oh, okay, so the new spirit was a couple cartoons about Donald Duck paying his income taxes. And up until that point, not everybody paid their taxes because it's unconstitutional. Yeah, but if Donald Duck is behind it, then, you know, right. that so would they, take care of it. Yes. So they get Donald Duck to make a cartoon about how he sends his little tax and like how to tabulate how much you owe. And it, this is called The New Spirit. And he 
pays his little taxes and they say taxes to beat the axes and then they show you where the taxes go and it's like this weird montage of um ammunition production and weapons production and it's like guns 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 we need more guns but it's just for the good guys though exactly it's for the the axes we need guns didn't donald have a an uncle or some relative named scrooge mcduck too yeah yeah he did so he would have paid more taxes because everything was proportional (laughs) and fair at that time Scrooge would would probably know how to get around paying his taxes yeah but you have mickey uh mini mouse saving her bacon grease to donate for uh, munitions, just um, all sorts of propaganda. D- Donald joins the Navy, I think. Um, there's a cartoon called Education for Death, the Making of a Nazi. Excuse me. It's super creepy. It deals with the life of a Nazi youth and like the psychological conditioning that makes a trained killer. Is that one of the things that Disney put out? Yeah. Yeah, there's a whole DVD set that's narrated by um, Leonard Malton, I think. Uh, Yeah, it's called Walt Disney on the Front Lines. It's, you know, three or four DVDs of all the collection of all of the war years um, cartoons that came out and the military training videos that he put out. So what happened to Walt Disney after the war stuff calmed down? So that is when we are getting into like the 50s and Disneyland. Right. So Disneyland is its did, own thing. Did right? that start around 54? Yeah, I think the park opened in 1955 officially. So okay. he, yeah. So he actually consulted with Stanford Research Institute. Do we know anything about that? Not really. I know I, I went to Disneyland when it first opened. Okay. But it was great. And they didn't tell us about Stanford Research Institute at that time. <laughs> when talking about um, Monarch Mind Control and MK Ultra, mm-hmm. Stanford Research Institute is a big player in housing these psychologists and these. Um, you know, all of the characters that you hear when you study MK Ultra, SRI is involved in this very heavily. So prior to the start of Disneyland, was Walt just working out of a studio, animation studio or something like that? Yeah, he, I don't know if he was still in Burbank at that time. Um, but somebody must have approached him with the idea of creating Disneyland. I think so. I I haven't read that. I've read several biographies of him and like all sorts of Disney. Like I have a whole shelf of Disney books, but somebody I, has to have offered the funding for it, right? Yeah. So he consults with SRI and the clients of SRI include, you know, all the branches in the military, the office of naval, naval research, mm-hmm. uh, DARPA, right? Right. So he's consulting with these people to determine the best location of the park. And it was decided um, by this character named C.V. Wood, who left SRI to become Disneyland's main engineer. He um, was the one who introduced Walt to the outside sponsors like Monsanto and GE. Because when you go to a theme park, it's um, an ad. Right. Every ride that you go on is sponsored by something. Yeah. Um, one time, you know, we went to Epcot and we went on the Norway ride in Epcot and it's all about offshore, offshore oil drilling. Yeah. You know, it's like a commercial or like the fossil fuels that we need um, brought to you by Ellen and Exxon. Yeah. Exactly. The dinosaurs, you know, brought to you by Exxon. Um, this is a funny one. Uh, UNESCO. I don't know if they still do, but they uh, used to sponsor Small World. You know, it's a small world after all. I remember that song and the ride. and some- Yeah. And UNESCO, is uh, its roots are in eugenics. Julian mm-hmm. Huxley, the brother of Aldous Huxley of Brave New World, uh, he was of the Eugenics Foundation in Britain and UNESCO. And so this is like all of this stuff is – and it's a small world. Eugenics, depopulation. Um, last time I went to the UNESCO website, they had a child with a big 
needle going into his arm. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Saying no one gets left behind. <laughs> In other and words, you, you can't escape, basically. Take that however you want it, right? Right. Um, so, okay, this is really weird and occultic, but um, Disneyland sits on Latitude 33, which is like famous for other strange events like Roswell and the Kennedy assassination. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the SRI Institute told Walt to put the carousel at this intersection of ley lines. And the ley lines is kind of a little pseudoscience. I think it's cool and, and I think it's possible and real. Have you heard of ley lines before? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's these intersecting ley lines at Disneyland and they're like, put the carousel right here. So this energy is like. Yeah. Spinning. It is kind of interesting. People who are good at dousing mm -hmm. can pick up ley lines, even if they're blindfolded. Mm -hmm. You know, they can tell you exactly where they are and where they cross. And well, like these, are, these are the people who invented GPS, you know, and radar and electromagnetic tools and things are telling Walt Disney where to put specific rides and things in Disneyland. And okay. To, okay. Yeah. So with this knowledge of ley lines, they built uh, rides and like, I think it was called the King Arthur's carousel. I don't think it's there anymore. The original Disneyland. That was, was a, I know there was a big one. Of, I don't know what it was called. Yeah. When it was, it was first built. Mm -hmm. So weird, right? Like, why are you getting top scientists that are working on GPS and weather radar to tell you where to put a child's a carousel? I mean, it's just, if you know about occult things, um, then that should really perk up your attention. What did you find out was the reason? Well, I think a lot of these things, these occulted esoteric things are hidden um, and they don't tell people that magic and science kind of dovetail into each other. You know, mm -hmm. Arthur C. Clarke said, you know, magic and science are, or any advanced technology looks like magic, basically, is what he said. Yeah, a lot of the, uh, you know, occult just means hidden. Mm -hmm. It's not not open to the usually the general public. And uh, some of the people who have talked about what's going on in the advanced technologies that are not given to the public by the government, mm -hmm. they're referred to as magic all the time. Yeah. But they really do them. Yeah. I mean, they've got fake flying saucers, for example, that are man-made. Werner von Braun knew all about this, and they're intended to be eventually used for fake alien invasion. And this was after the discovery of how to make uh, vehicles levitate like that. That's my conclusion, too. I just did a show about that called Aliens from Hell. Yeah. <laughs> about the fake alien invasion. These are not real aliens. They're, well, the aliens that are running the show on, their, on this planet, I guess. Yeah. And at the very end of this show, I'll give you a bonus about Disney and aliens. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So, what were we talking about? Oh, Disneyland. Okay. So, then you have Disneyland and then Disney World that came about in the 60s. Was it that long ago in Orlando? Yeah. So, um, hmm. in the 60s, the Disney operatives, like, they engaged in this conspiracy to make sure sellers had no idea who was buying the property in Central Florida because they didn't want the property rates to go up. Um, and they needed all of this room, in my opinion, I think, because they're doing, like, human trafficking and other all sorts of other crazy stuff. Wow. There. Um. So, Disney's key contact in the CIA was called William Wild Bill Donovan, who some people call him the father of the CIA. Hmm. Um, so, he provided fake identities for Disney agents to buy property and set up secret communications center and also a disinfo campaign to maintain control over the development. Of Disney World? Yes, Disney World in Florida. Okay. So they've got this these characters like this guy named Paul Hallowell, and he used um, they're used to working in the like geopolitical sphere, you know, uh, secret wars in Indochina and other psyops in Cuba, mm -hmm. and you know, came up with a way to um, 
start civil wars. So these are the people that they're hiring to work at Disney World or to work mm. on the development of Disney World. You know, why do you just jump out of the the Vietnam and Cuba and all of these like secret ops to go work on Disney World? It's just like really weird. So they helped them avoid taxation, environmental regulations, and they gave them immunity from laws in Florida. Um, so, and this is like a classic CIA strategy in foreign countries to set up a puppet government mm -hmm. and then use the regime to do your bidding, right? Right. You so, offer them favors if they'll obey. Yeah. So Disney's kind of like a puppet front of CIA. So, so on the surface, it looks like they're just providing all these wonderful rides and fun experiences for kids. Yeah. So it, that must have made you want to know what they're actually doing. Yeah. Other than that. So, and they also created like cities um, who their official residents would be like handpicked Disney loyalists, basically. And like they could swing elections or they could get things done in the local government hmm. there in Florida. And then this is a really weird place. Have you ever heard of Celebration, Florida? No. So this is a town that is adjacent to Disney World. That's an actual town. But all of the architecture and the houses and the main street is a like a Disney aesthetic. Does Disney somehow own the whole place? It used to, it, but it doesn't anymore. So things have changed a little bit. But like if you went to Celebration and you were walking down the street... Um, there's like music piping at you, kind of like in Disneyland. Uh -huh. They control the weather there in a way that they can make it snow magically and on Christmas Day. Mm. Um, all the residents are like super Disney freaks. Like this is where you move to if you, you know, worship Walt Disney. It's celebrating right, right, Florida. Right, right. It's got the weirdest vibe. Like we couldn't even stand to go in a coffee shop and be there for more than an hour because it just felt like a fake. It felt like the Truman Show is what celebration is like, like makes you wonder what's behind the facade i guess right yeah and like the people you know when you walk into the coffee shop and it go ding 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 and everyone looks at you like not one of us you know uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're like That's oh funny. i don't want to be here anymore but okay so they have celebration um the two cities that I think uh, Disney World goes under is like Buena Vista, Florida and Bay Lake, Florida. Mm. So anyways, but the parks, I mean, they reshaped Central Florida. Like Orlando is now just the home of theme parks, right? Right. And I think more people go through Disney World than any other place in the world. I think I've read that somewhere. Even, even compared to Disneyland, huh? Mm-hmm. And it's crazy because when you go there, um, I think they put this in in like 2009 or 10, is like you have to give them your fingerprint to enter the park. Yeah, I've heard that it's totally surveilled too. Every place it is has totally cam cameras. cameras. So they've got your fingerprint, they've got your name, they've got your credit card number, they've got your, um, you know, where you're from. And then if you go on that Epcot ride, the big geodesic golf ball ride okay yeah called um spaceship earth they're taking all kinds of pictures of your face and they're uh, making you into a cartoon character and then uh, when you you get off the ride they shoot you back to where you came from even though you didn't tell anybody like how do they know we're from austin texas but anyways mm. um so they've got all of your biometrics you know within an hour of entering the wow. world. And then we were talking about sponsors, right? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of where um, you might know about Monsanto. Oh, with your health background. Sure. Right? We, yeah. we, we don't like Monsanto, right? No, it's very destructive. N now they're bought by Bayer. But yeah. One of the really so, evil corporations. This was one of Tomorrowland's first sponsors. So you go to Disney 
pavilion and, and you want to see what the attractions are and it's brought to you by Mon- the plastic house of the future brought to you by Monsanto. Here's right. your, um, and then you get to take a tour of what you could live in in the future. And like, here's a space for your regular foods and a space for your irradiated foods because of like <laughs> <laughs> nuclear fallout or whatever is right, happening. It's right. ex- so it's crazy. But um, so like in, in 1935, Walt did this like world tour. Mm-hmm. And he actually got to meet with like H.G. Wells, mm, who is, uh, you know, a globalist and a, an influencer. Right. Um, him and H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, and Da Vinci were the inspiration for Tomorrowland because H.G. Tom- Wells. Was- Tomorrowland in California. Right. Yeah, I remember going there. Yeah. Um, Werner von Braun, he was a technical director on three Disney TV shows about space called Man in Space, Man on the Moon, and Mars and Beyond. And he appeared as one of Walt's experts on the world of tomorrow. Wow. And you can go Google this and you have a, you can see an old black and white picture of Walt and Werner von Braun just standing next to a rocket looking like best buddies. Yeah. Right. So I, I think he had second thoughts about being a villain before he died, because who, when Werner von Braun did? yeah, uh-huh. uh, when he was dying, there's a a lady named Carol. Uh, what's her last name? Maybe I'll remember. It's a a friend of uh, Doctor Stephen Greer, oh, who's Rosen. done a, a lot of investigation into ET activity mm-hmm. with the government. That's a lot. He's documented a lot of ET activity with the government and. Uh, that there is no evidence at all of any unfriendly ET activity at all. Mm. But Werner von Braun told uh, this lady Carol and uh, Dr. Carol something uh, that the whole development of artificial ET craft made by the U.S. military and corporations was to stage an alien invasion and use it as a motivating factor to get everybody to give up national sovereignty. Mm Mm-hmm. To bring in one world government. It's coming. I mean, I've been saying this for years, like the aliens are coming and it's not what you think it is. It's no, not. It, it's the fake aliens. Yeah. And, and it's been shown uh, by some of Stephen Greer's contacts that the abductions and the cattle mutilations and all that were all done by fake ETs. There's a really great documentary about that called Mirage Men. And if you are interested in like UFO disclosure and how things get uh, trickled down to the public and disseminated into con- conspiracy con and UFO cons and conventions and things like that. Um, it's a lot of psyops, a lot right. of lies, a lot of singling um, kind of people out and duping them and saying, um, you know, this comes from, you know, five star general, don't tell anyone, but we right. were tell everybody not to tell anybody. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So look up that documentary. Um, I What's think it called again? Mirage men. Okay. Yeah. So Epcot, I mean, this is like one of the most ideologically important pieces of land in the United States. Um, in Orlando. Yeah. Just for the sheer number of people that visit it, it every year and what it's got going on. I mean, it's about globalization, right? Epcot, all of the nations together uh-huh. under, yeah. under the pond of illumination, they call it. It's, just, it's a continuation of the fraud of the United Nations. Exactly. You know, peace and harmony. Right. And so that big ride, that golf ball looking thing um, this is actually sponsored by Siemens, which is a fine Nazi company whose corporate logo could be found right above Auschwitz. Right, right, right. Right? So, um, yeah, it's really weird because the theme of this ride is like the history of language and communication from cavemen up until the Matrix, basically, like the whole history of telecom and culture creation. Wow. Yeah. So, in a way... The Disneyland and Disney World are big advertising operations mm-hmm. for aspects oh. of the global future. Definitely, definitely. They are without a doubt that very thing. 
did you fig- did you figure out how all of that fits into the bigger picture of what's being done to the globe at this point to life all over the world yeah because i think there's not one place that you know disney has not been through its influence its movies its products it you know what are we going on like almost a hundred years now of disneyfication yeah yeah starting when do you think well they started their cartoons and stuff um in the late 20s early 30s yeah so just about a hundred years yeah and what's their goal well, I think their goal aligns with, you know, like the, the globalist agenda, um, UN, one world government, one world right. currency, yeah. everybody on the same uh, universal basic income, right. everybody in the same database so that they've got their proper, you know, stabbies. I don't know if you can say that on here. The, uh, proper what? <laughs> they're, they're, st- they're jabs. Oh, oh! You can say whatever you want. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. We're already, we're already kicked off of most of YouTube, and I have a list. I have a whole mm-hmm. list of words that I don't say on my channel. No, we well, decided. I'm, I'm always like spelling things. I know we've done that too, trying to stay on YouTube, but it didn't work. Yeah. Um, but we're so late in the game right now of what's happening, leading toward, you know, control. Yeah, but extermination as a point after that. Mm-hmm. That if we can't say anything now. You know, it's probably not the best service to the rest of the world. Well, Disney also has other agendas. I mean, did you see what just happened a couple of weeks ago when that Zoom meeting of the executives leaked out um, talking about their agenda of LGBTQ? No, I didn't see that one. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, look up that leaked Disney Zoom executives. Okay. Uh, openly discussing we need more um, gay characters we need more like uh, divergent characters you can really see that in the movies that come out yeah and they need more of it now why why do you think (sighs) honestly my own personal opinion you know i mean if you want to go to the top of the pyramid it's you know satan lucifer at the i agree with that so it just kind of and I don't see that as a belief system. I see it as something really happening. You I know? think this agenda has woken a lot of people up to some kind of spirituality. Yeah. Okay. See the dark side. Right. Because if you only see the physical level, you miss most of what's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so it's mind control on the whole society, basically, at this point. Right. And so why I keep mentioning the CIA is because this is MK Ultra is a CIA program. Yeah. It's not like a, a bunch of lone nuts doing these things. This is your government. This is the reason why it's so important for you to think that conspiracy theorists are crazy. I'm going to do it. <laughs> the orchestration is so thorough. Yeah, I'm going to do a show soon going back to the old book um, by John Coleman called The Committee of 300 just to see what he said back then and Mm -hmm. where we are now. Right. Um, That's a classic. But yeah, so I keep mentioning the CIA because of MKUltra and, you know, they are notorious for all of these experiments with LSD, with counterculture, um, Mm -hmm. you know, all of your boomer uh, rock and roll culture was influenced by the CIA yeah, um, and like Disneyland, that seemed fine when it was happening. Right. It seemed yeah. like an organic, you know. Yeah, we didn't see it as satanic at all. No, Just but that's fun, why fun music. That's why I had to learn what a satanic mindset is because it, you don't necessarily have to believe in Satan to be in a Satanist. Right, but I'm so, differentiating too, and, and it'd be interesting to get your perspective on this, but um, I'm differentiating between these belief systems. Mm-hmm. Like you said, the satanic one started, what, in the 50s or something you said? The Church of Satan. Church of Satan. Started in 1966. 66, okay. But the actual reality behind it 
has been going on for at least tens of thousands of years. Yeah, since right? the fall, basically. Yeah, yeah. And there are even little kids experimenting with it, turning off. We heard, you know, some of the people from Church of Satan, one of the big officials in it said how he got his start. And he was in a group of kids in a junior high school, I guess. And they would go in the boys' bathroom and turn off the lights and watch the mirror and have these satanic images appear in the mirror and light up the room that way mm -hmm. and tell them what they should do. Mm -hmm. And they didn't come with any belief system. Mm. I mean, it was something that was actually happening. Yeah, you, you don't have to know much to do a Ouija board, but it'll work. Yeah, those, those things really happen. Yeah. yeah. So then the CIA also had this thing called um, Project Mockingbird, which was um, about the news media and using the news media for propaganda. Have you right. heard of that one? Um, so, sure. yeah, they spilt spent millions per year hiring journalists from Disney and ABC and others to promote whatever point of view that they're trying to promote. Um, and then you have like files that were obtained revealed that the department of defense and the CIA backed and influenced like hundreds of movies and shows owned by the Walt Disney company. Right. 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 So you, you just think these are just innocent cartoons that came from creative minds and people who, who ha have like a child at heart, but it's not, this is an agenda, yeah, a very well-oiled machine. It has a really well done facade of complete wholesomeness. Yeah. How does this fit into the re fairly recent takeover of the major Hollywood studios by the CCP? I just did a show about, Karl Marx and his ideology. And do you know anything about that? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. He, so I read two books about just the life of Karl Marx and his personality and who he was. He hated God. Uh -huh. He was a poet who would write satanic poetry. Um, he write plays. His favorite was, um, his favorite character of literature was Mephistopheles from the play Faustus, where the, he uh, sells a soul to the devil. Um, the number one goal of communism, according to Karl Marx, uh -huh. is to kill the Christian church and eliminate God altogether. <laughs> um, so, when you talk about communism... is very satanic in my opinion and the heads of you know the people who wrote communist manifesto right I also read wrote odes to lucifer and satan and saying i hate christianity i hate god i hate life i you know right yeah because you know if you if you really analyze marxism and communism they're systems to destroy any individual motivation to achieve anything in life and everybody becomes part of the hive and individuals are worthless. Yes. He saw mm -hmm. people as just like useless eaters, bellies to be filled. Right. So you have your Darwinian theories that um, we're just the smartest animal mm -hmm. in a, a group of animals. And then you have your Marxian theories that, you know, everyone's problem is just economic. And if you give someone enough, if you fill their belly, then that's all that you could hope for. So, and all of these ideologies, the, they are taking man down. Right. Right. To a base level of existence. And the people who helped originate them like Marx could really be seen as victims of the trauma-based mind control that you're talking about. Well, this is so interesting because I was reading this book and he grew up Christian. I mean, he was uh, born Jewish. His family converted to Christianity. He wrote all kinds of beautiful poetry about the Bible, about Christ. Um, he Some, Something happened. He was from Trier, Germany, which is a very like um, precious town for relics and heritage for Christians. I think uh -huh. the robe is housed there. Uh -huh, so okay. something happened when he went to Berlin to go to college. He became some kind of like, did a 180. So there was some kind of event. 
Yes. And of all the biographies I was reading of him, I couldn't figure out like what was the trigger that just totally sent him going down the opposite path, but he yeah. did. It's becoming um, like an alternate personality. Yeah. Definitely. A lot of these people were started out as Christian artists and then like somehow their art was not appreciated and they had wow. a wow. crisis and they're just like, oh, kill everyone. <laughs> you know? So I'm, I'm interested in patterns and as a homeschooled, free thinking person, you would tend to look and say, what is, what's the meaning of what happened? You know, yeah. you're seeing... Uh the more you look at the ruling people that are seen as really evil in the world right now and the ones that to me look like they're following an agenda to destroy life completely, not just reduction. And you look into each one, you know, everybody likes to hate them, but they all look like victims of mind problems, mind control or something. I was talking about this on the show that we did last night. Um, we were doing it about Elon Musk. Right. And a lot of these people think they're doing the right thing. Well, some of them also are getting second thoughts about participating in the destruction of life. Yeah. You know, because Elon was responsible, as far as I know, for SpaceX and putting... 5G radiating satellites all over the world, mm -hmm. which is pretty destructive. Starlink? Is that star, a star, a star, star, Starlink is a communication system, and it, I think it's connected to the satellites. Uh -huh. uh, but the basic idea is to have no place on Earth that doesn't have 5G. Ooh, that's terrible. And then, yeah, we were talking about Neuralink as well. Right. Where... This actually requires you to get an implant in your head. Yeah. So you can be some kind of receptor of Wi Fi. Yeah, you're merging computer with brain. And this reminded me of MK Ultra Doctor named Jose Delgado. Okay. And he wrote a book called Physical Control of the Mind. And mm. there's footage of him and his testing on monkeys and on bulls. And they actually had it where you could remote control a giant. Sorry, there's a bug in here. That's the, that's the bull that stopped short of hitting the matador, right? Yes. When they so, hit a switch. Mm -hmm. So that's Jose Delgado's research. And this is okay. like, sounds exactly like Neuralink. Right. So what were you going to say about Musk? Um, all of these people have interesting, oh, okay, so they're very sensitive, artistic types, uh, passionate, sincere, and then they have some kind of conversion, like an anti, you know how Paul had his conversion on the road to Damascus? Yeah, yeah. Paul, you remember that story? where like he you're talking about a negative conversion. I'm talking about anti-conversion because right. they all had Christian background. I mean, Stalin was in seminary to be an Orthodox priest before he mm. flipped a switch and became a communist leader. So if you, have you tried to figure out what happened? What's the common element? Um, bullying. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. I think people who feel disenfranchised look for power wherever they can. And people who are oppressed and, you know, like d abused... Mm -hmm. um, they want to stop it somehow and they think that they can get power from the devil or spells or occultism or you know like anybody who feels like they don't have the earthly power they look to another darker power Okay, um, I'm thinking you know like <sighs> women who feel like they don't have any recourse so they become a witch or something right. like you know sure. And I think Elon Musk was a nerd. I think he was probably sensitive, um, wanting to fit in, wanting to be recognized for some kind of artistic endeavor or, you know, scientific achievement. Mm -hmm. And they were probably um, ridiculed a lot. Um, and seeking some kind of, you know, th that's the kind of person who tries to make a deal with a demon. Yeah, so yeah. what's the difference between 
somebody that results to pressure and intimidation by doing that versus somebody who just says, well, you know, that's just what's happening. I got to deal with it. Um, probably their support system and the level to which they're isolated because if you're bullied at school and you come home and you have a nice family, you, you at least you have right. a little bit of grounding and, you know. They can remind you that it's not really your fault. Yeah, or this will get better, this will pass. Like, I have my tribe, you know, right. even if I don't fit in over here, I still have these people. So, I really think alienation, um, having a very sensitive nature that just snaps, being charismatic Mm-hmm. Um, like Hitler was very charismatic, but he was also on a lot of drugs. So there's that. Um, also, I think people who are influenced by demons listen to people who are also influenced by demons. Yeah, yeah. The whole like, they, they resonate with that. I I agree. Once it gets started, it's a cycle that keeps going. Because me and my husband were talking and we're like, how do people keep falling for the stupid stuff like Scientology or cult leaders or, you know, it's just obviously a scam, you know? Yeah, but it answers all the questions. But he, yeah, he's like, well, you know, I think people who allow themselves to be influenced by demons, that this is what is happening so that they're deceived about reality. So they're receptive to it. Yeah. So you already have an automatic fan base when you're telling lies. Right. It's really crazy to think about because I'm like, how could, how do these people even pay bills? I mean, you, you've given your whole life to Scientology. Obviously, this is, you know, he's a science fiction writer. He's a con man. But he does have some techniques and tactics that were honed in by CIA and to go back and hypno regress and go back to your trauma. If you can get somebody to visit their trauma again <clears throat> and try and like release that or help them with that somehow, then you've got a faithful right. follower. Right. And I don't know if you've ever heard of like Teal Swan. No, I don't know that one. So she's an up and coming kind of like cult leader. Um, there's a documentary about her called The Deep End. And she says that she was a victim of satanic ritual abuse. Mm -hmm. and now she has all of these followers but she gets people to go back and like into their trauma and she holds them while they cry and they float in the pool and they like release emotions this is kind of how scientology works where they hook you onto that e-meter and they get you to go back to your traumatic events and you relive those until you don't feel anything anymore and that's how you're cleared of your feet wow. except whatever. what's really happening is not necessarily making you clear no, it's just you're jumping in out of the frying pan into the fire. Mm -hmm. It's not, this is not the way <laughs> to no. deal with your traumas. We have a way to do that, but it's not Scientology. So, What's the way to do it? Well, my personal journey, um, like I said, I was raised Christian and then I kind of just like kind of did my own thing. Uh, for 10 years in my 20s or maybe 15 years, uh, studied all of the different religions. Right. That's interesting. Um, along with conspiracies, mind control calls mm -hmm. and seeing how they all interlock and, you know, how one thing, one node <laughs> points to the other and you just got to mm -hmm. connect them like the conspiracy theorists has the little yarn like <laughs> right you know I mean? like the cards with the yarn and like this goes to this that. you're creating a web yeah exactly so i went through a very tough time i went through a like a dark night of the soul almost um where i didn't want to be here anymore because, because of finding out all these terrible things that were going on every i mean everything collapsed in my life you know relationships job money uh just was a perfect storm right, okay where i found myself like don't even want to get out of bed again right, ever right. because why should i if we live in a satanic oligarchy okay i don't I, even want to say i don't even want to try and build up another life or you know, and you knew enough you, you or, knew enough about it that it, you knew it was real 
Right. And, and it was just really discouraging. And so with that, I could always kind of keep that in on its shelf and not let it traumatize me because I had a steady family or I had a partner or I had, you know, like mm -hmm. a home. But when that was shifting, then this just kind of overwhelmed uh, me, you know? Right, so I'm right. like, why do I even want to start over when the things are the way they are? Yeah, I could see that. Um, so I tried to go to church, but it was not for me. And then I went to the Orthodox Christian Church, um, and it was, if I could paint a picture, it was like a soldier with arrows in their back, like crawling over the threshold to a safe space, almost dead, you know, I'm like, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, this is the last thing I'm ever going to try. <laughs> and right. if it doesn't work, I'm going to live my life as a bed. So <laughs> mm -hmm. I found, thank God, you know, the best church I could, the Orthodox Christian Church. And they picked me up and they cleaned me off and they, you know, dried my tears and they right. fed me meals and they were my family. And they're like, this is hard what you're going through. We can't even begin to understand. Like, all of this occult pressure that you have, but obviously you're very, you know, in need of a safe place right. and a theology that will help you in life and a meaning for suffering. And just, uh, I'm, I'm a beggar that knows where to find bread now. Right. That's right? good. And you can still work with the dark stuff that you're studying without having it overwhelm you. Yes, because once you've seen enough darkness, you know where the light is. Yeah, and, and you know that darkness is a temporary phenomenon, mm -hmm. and, and light is not. Mm -hmm. So, in, in going through the, what I had to do to join that church, I mean, it's a very in-detail process. You don't mm -hmm. just go there. You don't just sign up. No. Um, it's like getting married, I don't, if you want to know this, we can talk about something else or not. No, I'm interested. You know, people are getting introduced to who you are and what you've learned in your life because that's what everybody's trying to do in their own way. The way they explain it to you is very much like a marriage. Like you meet someone, you are, you know, have a getting to know you phase and then you have an engagement and then you have a marriage. Mm -hmm. So the getting to know is just attending the services and seeing what's about, meeting the people. Um, and then, <clears throat> you can go to an inquirer's class and you do this for at least a year. You go to class every week. So they teach you proper Christian theology. What's it called again? Orthodox Christian church. No, the class. Catechumen class. Inquirer class. Inquirer. Yeah. So okay. first you start off as an inquirer. You know? Okay. Okay. Got being, it. Being uh, introduced to what the church is about. Right. And then, so if you keep on going and you're going to classes and you decide, like, eventually I do want to join the church. Yeah, mm -hmm. I want to do this. Mm -hmm. So you become a catechumen and that's kind of like you're engaged and you keep going to class and they, they teach you step by step, like, what do we believe? This is why, this is why we don't believe what we don't believe. And this is so helpful because it gives you a frame of reference for like, the Christian church as it should be and as has it as it has been since the New Testament. Mm -hmm. um, we have something called apostolic succession. So our priests have um, come down from, you know, the apostles in the New Testament and they've been made priests and made priests and made priests and made priests. They're tracing a succession line all the way back. Exactly. Yeah. So and this is what keeps cults from happening, and this is what keeps uh Christians from getting a bad name because you can say, I'm a Christian and I read my Bible and I believe this and this and this. And, but you don't, you can't say that. Like you <sighs> properly interpreting scripture is what you have to take the class for. So you don't get it wrong and you don't misinterpret things and you don't become some kind of cult leader like Joel Olstein or, uh, the mega church pastor that obviously is just in it for the money. There's right? a lot of that, yeah. Yeah, prosperity gospel and goofy things that make the church look bad. Um, 
this is why we we do the orthodoxy the way we do it so how does that help you to see what physical activities you could do to contribute to the future not being what the rulers are trying to do right now first you got to get yourself in order right because this stuff will kill you if you look into it enough like what is that they say if you look into the abyss and the abyss looks back at you right and they say you become it and all yeah yeah so you need some kind of armor like spiritual protection i was out there trying to fight the devil with no backup and no weapons yeah, right? yeah. I was all willy nilly talking about Disney's evil and mind control and all this. And I got clobbered in life and I had nothing to like cling to. So. So you're actually lucky that you got through that. I'm so lucky. And so this gives you, you know, like an arc to be on while you fight. Yeah. You know, and some spiritual helpers. And even if they don't know what you're doing, a lot of my Orthodox friends or my priest or whoever I met, I didn't tell them any of this stuff because how do you interject that into a polite conversation? You know, which, which stuff you didn't tell them? Oh, you know, they, they would be like, well, what do you do? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> I, mm. I drive Uber, <laughs> just right. trying to be like a normie. Right. Because you don't always want to just, go into the deep end like oh did you hear about satanic ritual abuse or whatever like you can't just splooge but, it on people and yet you are continuing that work now mm -hmm. right with your investigation work and putting it all together and understanding the network of all these groups and things like that yeah but now i have a safe place to go with depression with being overwhelmed with right. whatever it is like it's just so much better doing this now that I have that. It's a lot more safe for my psyche. So right. what's, the, what's the current state of the work that you're doing? What, what's it focused on? Um, right now, I've just branched out on my own. So I worked with um, a, my partner. His name was Freeman on Freeman TV. We did that from before the internet up until about 2015. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's when I wrote the three books. And then um, I kind of took a break. And then I met my husband. And we kept on doing the shows. Jay's analysis. He's a very gifted theologian and conspiracy theorist. And he yeah. hosts Alex Jones uh, a lot. He's, he's great. Doug and I are both fans. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So we do. He's also Orthodox Christian. Um, so we do that together, and I just started my own show with a girlfriend of mine, um, just because I was overflowing with ideas. So what's it about? It's called Out of This World, and it's about all of this content we've been talking about today, everything in my book. Um, we've talked about health. We've talked about beauty products. We've talked about um, toxicity in everyday chemicals that you come in contact with, you know, purging your house and your body of chemicals. Right. Um, we talked about aliens. We've talked about communism, Grimes, Elon Musk, um, gut health, mm -hmm. a light diet. I'm trying to think of other episodes we've done. Next week is dinosaurs. So just, it's kind of all over the place. It's really fun. Um, it's me and her. And uh, it's just... How do people listen to that? You can go to my YouTube channel, which is just my name, Jamie, J-A-M-I-E, Hanshaw, H-A-N-S-H-A-W. And the show's called Out of This World. So far, YouTube doesn't consider it a threat. I guess. Not yet. I'm under the radar because I only have like 3,000 subscribers right now. So uh -huh. I kind of like that it's not big so I can say whatever I want and no right. one's, you know, it, it's my own little art project almost. My husband's like, title it this so you get more clicks. And I'm like, but I want to title it this because it's, it's my art, you know, I don't right, care about right. it. Like I want little Easter eggs in there, but 
yeah, we're having a lot of fun. I do uh, lots of podcasts with my husband about movies. We analyze movies a lot. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. So his two books um, are called Esoteric Hollywood 1 and 2. Mm-hmm. And so he just takes all of the famous movies and breaks them down and tells you what you're watching esoterically. Uh, so if you watch a movie, you're like, what is going on? A movie like, let's say, 2001 Space Odyssey. Right. I remember that. Which is, you know, rife with uh, occult themes and esoteric and alchemical and mm-hmm. technological secrets and things like that. So um, any movie you were watching and you're like, I wonder what is really happening. It's probably in his book. He's an essay on it. So would, yeah. That. And those are available somewhere on Amazon? Those are, like that? They are, but you can get them directly from us if you want signed copies. Sure. Um, and that's Jay's Analysis, J-A-Y-S-A-N-A-L-Y-S-I-S, Analysis, Jay's Analysis. Dot com, basically. Yep. Okay. And... As a bottom line, you know, after all that, what you've learned through all your studies and experiences and ups and downs and stuff, what would you want people to know? You know, what do you think is important to convey? After all this discussion, what what do you want them to remember? I I want everyone to join the Orthodox Church, honestly. I just think it is the best thing in life you could ever do. Um, I think it will... solve most mankind's problems and just it's such a deep rich uh, historic solid foundation to start your life or to mend your life wherever you're at if you don't at least go see a divine liturgy once i mean it's almost like here's a treasure chest mm-hmm that you can take from and it, you never get to the bottom and you just pull out treasures and diamonds and pearls and, and is that a video that you mentioned the orthodox church no you said at least go see oh no 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 um that's what we do on sunday Something oh more. okay yeah and, that, and it probably has branches all over the place yeah it's called the divine liturgy and there's Greek Orthodox Church, there's American Orthodox Church, there's Serbian Orthodox Church, there's Russian. So whatever is close to you. Um, yeah, from what I've heard about the Russian Orthodox Church, it's, it goes together with um, making Russia a lot like what America was supposed to originally be. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, well, it goes all the way back to, you know, the New Testament. And then the first Orthodox Empire was the Byzantine Empire where the king was uh, an Orthodox Christian and yeah. their, um, their government was like, they call it I, Synergia. That was when it was splitting into East and West, right? That, the split was the Catholic Church off of the Orthodox Church. So that okay. happened like 1000 AD, somewhere around there. Yeah. The, the Roman Catholic Church left the orth- the rest of the church. And so you have, that's why they call it Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church. Right, right, right. So the Roman Catholic Church is not part of us for a thousand years. And that's why they have so many problems. And what was, what was that? This is probably wrong, but was the original Byzantine center in Constantinople? Yes, exactly. Okay, I thought I might have remembered that. So, if, if somebody wanted to learn more about the whole belief system that is basically Eastern Orthodox, mm-hmm. is there something online that is good about that for education? Um, it's not really something that you can do online because it is about community and okay. it's about communion and meeting people and not being alone. So, they'd have to go and experience it. Yeah, yeah, just just walk in the door and see how you feel. And, you know, the first time I went, I was kind of like, this is weird because they're wearing black robes and they look like wizards. And this looks like, you know, <laughs> they've got long beards and they're doing incense balls. And uh-huh. But if you allow yourself to just um, watch a little bit, you'll see so much beauty. I mean, the what happens on Sunday morning is basically like a... 
1200 year old play that has not really changed throughout the centuries. Mm -hmm. And it's the story of, you know, life and death and resurrection. And it ends with our communion that you can't take communion unless you have joined the church already. In the, in the olden days, they wouldn't even let people watch that part. So, it's a very mm. um, mystical thing that takes place. Okay. Well, it's good that you're talking about it as an example of what it's done for your life. You know, it seems to have been obviously transformation for you. It, it's good for people also who have um, religious trauma. Which is, what's religious trauma? Um, just people who were like raised in some kind of church that was abusive or their parents were Christian and they abused them or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just people who are disenchanted with the church altogether. You probably not have tried orthodoxy. Right. Yeah, I've experienced some of that. I know that um, I've met major criminal types in every major religion, including Christianity. And it's more, it has to be more than a label. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Uh, it saved my life. But if you, um, if you want to do one more little topic, I promise we would talk about the Disney UFO phenomenon. Oh, sure. Yeah, we can do that briefly. Um, Go ahead. So, you've seen the movie Alien, right? Ridley Scott? I, I do remember it, yeah. With Sigourney Weaver and... Yeah. And people, yeah. Um, don't you think that would make a perfect ride for children at a theme park? Oh, absolutely. It's so wholesome. Yeah. And uplifting. Okay, so in January 1995, the, um, the Walt Disney World hosted this UFO convention. Mm -hmm. And they had a two-week conference on ET and UFO phenomenon, which featured like scientists, authors, and former military and this thing was not advertised to the public. It was just like a private invitation only. In 95, you said? Yeah, 1995. Okay. And then, so this was all in preparation for their new ride in the new Tomorrowland called Extraterrestrial Alien Encounter. Huh. And the whole point of this is about... Um, well, I think what they were talking about in this convention was like disclosure, how to, like you said, do a convincing alien invasion, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. make it look real. Yeah. So, um, basically, the, the ride is aliens exist, you are going to meet them, and this is to prepare you for that. Wow, Thank that's you interesting. Her. You know, how does that fit together with the fact that Walt Disney was hired to uh, make aliens look like ridiculous little green men that were, you know, not existing too. How did they put that together? A psyop, isn't it? Yeah, there was a Stephen Greer talks a lot about this. How uh, Disney got a contract to make sure that nobody believed in the alien stuff hmm. and portray them as little green creatures, mm -hmm. kind of a comical way. And mm -hmm. it sounds like what you're describing is how to make people feel like they're preparing for meeting real aliens. Yeah, well, right. they had this documentary that they made that they didn't release um, about the, the ride and everything. And they claim that intelligent beings are beckoning mankind to join the galactic community. Okay. Um, they referenced the Brookings Report. That was like this 1960 report that said that if we unleash the knowledge of aliens onto the American public, that they would lose, the, it would just like destroy the fabric of society. Right. Too disturbing. Yeah. Um, but since we invented the atomic bomb, that was mankind's calling card announcing that we are evolved enough <laughs> Now that we need alien intervention to keep us from destroying Earth. Okay. All right. So, yeah. yeah, look up um, the Lost Disney UFO documentary, I think it's called, because it was never, it was supposed to air on, um, you know, what was that show they had? Sunday, Disney Sunday or whatever on ABC. They used to have that. Is that something that you have? It's on uh, YouTube. 
Is it? Okay. Yeah. But so this ride was so terrifying that they had to tone it down because children were crying and being traumatized by it. And so they toned it down twice and then they had to scrap it all together just because it was just way too scary for a Disneyland. Wow. So their psychologists weren't very accurate in how people would react to it. Not yet. I think they were trying to make the aliens scary at that point. But yeah, it, the alien invasion is, we can talk about that forever. Uh, maybe if we ever do another show, because that's like um, Day the Earth Stood Still. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that was the same message about the aliens have to come here and save us from ourselves because we're about to blow it up. Yeah, although what Werner von Braun was talking about as an actual plan was um, fake aliens, you know, terrifying everybody to give up their rights and their sovereignty and their separate countries and all that so that they would have to, it would be like Independence Day. Mm -hmm. and they'd have to all work together to fight off the common enemy. Wasn't asteroids in that list also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a global threat. Yeah. Well, obviously, you should give up your rights to fight asteroids too. Right. Big rock is coming, so. Yeah. It's crazy. Well, neat. So, I think, you know, the main thing is people getting introduced to all that you're involved in now. And do you want to, if anybody wants to communicate with you, are there ways to do that? Uh. Yeah, you can leave a comment on my YouTube. I usually read all of those. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Okay. So I have all the standard yeah, um, social just media. Just under your name, Jamie Hanshaw. That's it. Okay. Yep. And the show is called Out of This World, and there is a new episode airing tonight. Oh, well, this is pre-recorded, isn't it? So y Yeah, but yeah. once a week, did you say? Yeah, every Thursday, yep. Thursday at what time? Um, just like Thursday evening, 8 p.m. usually. 8 p.m. Central? Yeah. And next week, we're talking about are dinosaurs real or fake? This is a really fun topic. I'm having a lot of uh, fun researching if, you know, if a T-Rex is actually a real thing or not. You mean currently or in the past? Ever. Oh, ever. That, yeah. yeah. That should be a really interesting question to look at. Yeah. So you can play part of Jurassic Park to prove they're real. We just saw that today. We Did saw you, the, the, yeah, the new one. Um, and I bet you didn't remember that Jurassic Park is all about genetically modified I did. creatures and um, yeah. DNA splicing. And there's and, a lot of important stuff in that original Jurassic Park movie. Yeah. Ooh. And well, this one we saw was all about cloning and virgin birth through wow. cloning. So, yeah, we're going to have fun. Wow. Yeah, Jeff Goldblum's character was saying in the original one that the scientists didn't understand just because they could do something doesn't mean that they should. Mm -hmm. And do you remember he was a chaos mathematician? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And nobody understood it. Right. But it means basically everything's connected, mm -hmm. which I think is true. So, okay, well, hopefully people will keep up with you on YouTube and uh, comment on the videos and watch the radio show and see where it goes from there. And read your books, too. And the books are, what's the best place to get the books again? Um, jaysanalysis.com. Okay, that's the, web, that's the website that you're using right now. Yeah. Okay, sounds great. Thanks for sharing the personal stuff, too. It's really get to, good to get to meet you as a person. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. Hold on. We'll say goodbye in the break here. Okay. So there goes Jamie Hanshaw, and a uh, really interesting lady, inspiring, and has done a lot of great work, and her books are available, weird stuff, and they're available for, on uh, jaysanalysis.com, J-A-Y-S-A-N-A-L-Y-S-I-S. Dot com. Um, that's weird stuff. And her third book, I don't think I wrote the title down, but they're all there and you can get um, you can get autographed copies at jasonalysis.com. And it's interesting the as Doug and I were talking about the individual paths that people go along 
and discovering what they're learning about life. And for Jamie, I, I enjoyed the fact that she was willing to share her personal story and what she went through and how studying all of this uh, network of nefarious cults and everything had such a negative effect on her when it coalesced with difficult physical things that happened in her life and how she had to get some kind of a spiritual foundation in order to get through that and turn it around. And it was really neat to learn how she did that. I didn't know anything about it. I don't think Doug did either that she and Jay are both uh, fully involved in the Eastern Orthodox church, but it certainly seems to have saved her stability and given her a focus for life right now. That's great. And I encourage people to find what that is for you. Uh, because I agree that it's really important. And if you are um, focusing on studying really negative stuff, which is what you run into if you want to learn what's happening in the world right now, um, basically I've come to the same conclusion. It's under the control of a network of mafias. And that's probably an insult to the regular mafias that are just criminal gangs. This is really dark and I think... Uh, at the top level, satanically inspired and directed, not by religion, but by the actual non-human um, entities that are behind it and giving orders to the top families and individuals that are controlling the world. And I think not only for an individual is it necessary to find some stable point, spiritual, not necessarily in something that you memorize, but something you actually connect to that changes your existence. And it's going to be necessary for the society at, at large as well. And we're at, at a real turning point right now. And I don't think that you can really go out and convince people to be spiritual. That's not going to work. If, if they're coming from a different point of view, they're just going to want to argue with you or worse. So it's like, who was it? Who was it said, become the change you want to see in the world? And that wasn't just to take the responsibility away so that you don't have to do anything to improve the world. I think if you have some conscious awareness of what's going on and what's needed, it gives you a responsibility. But the way to fulfill the responsibility is not going out and trying to force everybody else to change. There's some kind of a hidden PowerPoint when you change yourself. It changes the uh, effect that your words and your actions and your silence and your presence have on everybody else. And it's the best advice I've heard, and it's just a matter of understanding what it means on a deeper level, uh, transforming your own life, looking at what you're doing and what thoughts and emotions are dragging you around all day, every day. That's like a mantra or a prayer or a meditation that everybody has and that we're doing 24 hours a day and we're so used to it, we don't notice it. So becoming aware of it lets you know if it's what you want to be running your life or if you need to change it to a different focus. And that's what we're trying to deal with in planetaryhealingclub.com. If you're interested, you can check that out. But whether you do anything with us or on your own or with friends or anybody that is inspiring or helpful or supportive to you, this inner connection needs to be regained before the uh, agenda of the world rulers comes to its conclusion. So whatever time that we've got left is really valuable. And I don't know how much it is, but I just encourage you to value it, use it well, get your health back by natural means, learn what that's about, become aware of where your thoughts and emotions are all day and decide if that's where you want them because they're really powerful. And um, heal yourself on every level that you can. And it's the best way to affect everybody else that you care about which ultimately should be everybody. And we're all involved in that same effort. So you're very much appreciated. Stay in touch with our radio shows at lostartsradio.com. And these are continuing commercial free broadcasts. We've got a lot of um, really exciting ones coming up. 
many of which can only be aired on certain platforms. And you'll be able to stay in touch with those at lostartsradio.com. And if you want to help us stay on the air and you've got resources, you can donate at lostartsradio.com or there's also a subscribe star link there too, and both work just fine. Uh, but mainly, become what you want the world to be like. I'm trying to do the same thing, and we, most of us have a long way to go, but even being aware of the direction that we need to go in uh, toward what's permanent, as Jamie said, toward light, and realize that the darkness has no power compared to that, um, that can start a wave of something that covers the world quickly, and you could be the trigger point. Um, it's important to realize that you know we're talking about mind control and brainwashing and things that are being we're being subject to all the time right now, and to realize that that's just nonsense. You're not the helpless, weak, limited mortal being that you're supposed to believe. And if you can break free of those preconceived untruths whatever is real inside you can come out and that's the healing power that we've forgotten about but you're it so um, get back in touch with who you are that leads to where you came from awareness on a bigger level we're all trying to help each other get there as soon as possible so you're very much appreciated thanks for being here um, stay in touch with us feedback is welcome it's a contact form at lostartsradio.com suggestions of what you'd like to deal with and like us to deal with in future shows or at planetary healing club uh, let us know all the communications are read and responded to as possible so thanks for being here again and take it easy have a good night we'll meet you here next time <music>